Hey, Jason, happy new year, man. Good to see you. Eric, happy new year. It is amazing <laughs> to see you. It's been a long time since you and I chatted. This is a really interesting time because I feel like I have exactly switched places with the younger you when we first started this podcast. I think I had just, I had already, uh, you know, not very long before. Yeah. So like, uh, I'm looking ahead, I'm projecting forward. Of course, there's been some great market days here in the past month or so, um, that have helped kind of give me a little momentum, but I'm looking forward to hitting the fine number this year. I Woo! want, as the new year kind of ticks over, I wanted to take some time and I'm someone who's very systems and process oriented, and yes. especially in the new year, I like sitting down and doing this sort of reflection on last year and projecting toward the new year. So I thought this would be a good chance for you and I to compare notes, pre-fi, post-fi, maybe talk a little bit about what I do presently, how that might change when I get into your seat and kind of see how things have changed for you over the years too. So that sound like a good plan? It's perfect. I think you've teed it up well. I, for one, uh, think I'm speaking for our audience when I say I'm looking forward to you taking the question mark off your <laughs> RE date uh, on the bottom of the screen here. So uh, yeah, I love systems too. I, I suspect in some respects mine are simpler because I have fewer things to do, but I might overcomplicate those fewer things. Okay. But honestly, I think I've made some progress this year, but we'll compare notes and I will accept whatever judgment is coming. In general, what I do when I start these kind of year-end review process and goal setting exercise is I look back at the year, the previous year. So reflecting back on 2023, I made some big changes in the business and, and, you know, I try and come up with kind of this summary statement for what the year was. And so the one I came up with, and I'm just reading from my notion here, if you want different results, you have to do different things. So I had been doing the same thing for a long time in the business yeah. and it was working. Uh, but it could have been working a lot better. And 2023 made me realize that. I had some big wins financially, but it was a spendy year on year increase in terms of business expenses. And I think one of the biggest learnings that I had was investing in a small business can have really outsized returns. And I hadn't really appreciated that before. I had this scarcity mindset for a long time where yeah. I didn't want to hire for different you know, layers of expertise. And I just kind of wanted to put my arms around it and keep it here. And that was really small thinking, especially as I look back on 2023 and I see the investments that I made had huge ROI. So that was one of my big learnings. The other couple of things, it was a little spendy from a personal expense standpoint. We had a couple of big trips in there, which I don't regret at all. You know, one right. of them was was coming out to visit you and celebrate our 50th birthdays. We had some other kind of splurges. We bought a new vehicle and especially at the end of the year, we kind of like blew it out a little bit. And so now like that's starting to color a little bit of what my <laughs> 2024 looks like. What, what would you say? Do you do a year end summary at your stage or are you just like, yeah. eh, not really? I do actually. And uh, you know, part of it is just the normal quarterly net worth roll up. Oh, yeah. um, and I, and, but that includes a year over year look back. Yep. But also I look at spending and I look at um, how did I spend relative to budget? What months did I go over? Did I go over my uh, ceiling for withdrawal rate, which is based on CAPE, as you know, from our, our safe withdrawal rate toolbox episodes. Uh, and so I have been tracking that in the background automatically. You know, it just kind of populates itself. Uh, and then at the end of the year, I look at that. And this is the first full year, I think, that I was on the CAPE withdrawal rate based strategy. Oh, okay. yeah. And I made some big changes this year in terms of increasing the withdrawal rate by over 40% um, relative to the past. And some of that was just addressing some mental accounting I was doing. Some of that was realistically, you know, loosening, you know, the straps on things a little bit because I was being too conservative on things. So, so yeah, that is my normal process. I look at it from all aspects, uh, prep, but but primarily, if you bucket it, it's you know budget, you know expense tracking, yep. and then where is the portfolio, and how did we do relative to expectations? So, but yeah, that's my standard process. All right. So, but there's no kind of high level like, hey, it was a good year. I felt good oh, here. Yeah. I didn't feel good there. Like any summary kind of statement or yeah, I can't. I can make one, but it, it's true that I my process isn't doesn't define that, and I I didn't actually do that kind of summary until we talked about how you uh, approach yours. So if I have to put a, a statement around it, I would say really spendy on healthcare. And I know you and I are going to talk about that more on the show in a separate episode. Yep. But overall, finances were in control and under my Cape withdrawal rate based ceiling for the year. But there were several months that I went well above that primarily for medical and dental spending. Uh, and if I had to sum up the the kind of how I felt about it all, I would say, 
more comfortable this year than last year, which was more comfortable than the previous. But on the same note, I'm being honest with myself that with the market behaving a lot more <laughs> on the whole, that's only going to make it easier. Um, so for me, I'm, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm still getting used to this idea of, you know, some years are going to look like last year where we had planned to spend more, but then we spent even more in terms of healthcare expenses. So I feel good, but I hope that that's not the typical year. So variable withdrawal rate strategy in play now that's using right. the CAPE um, to, uh, in Karsten's safe withdrawal rate toolbox uh, as your ceiling. What was the average withdrawal on the portfolio? Do you mind uh, sharing? The average, the average withdrawal was a little over 4%. Okay. Yeah. And so as part of your net worth roll up, I presume, well, actually, I'm not presuming because I know that you do this because you you texted me, I think, on New Year's Day and I was I doing other things, so I didn't have mine <laughs> done yet. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. So net worth, what do you include in that statement and how, how did the numbers shake out? Yeah, so I, I do do a, a portfolio type roll up, which is the, the most important one. And then I do a second one, which is net worth, including like home equity and things like that. I don't think that latter is terribly interesting, but it's an easy enough thing to track. And Lori often asks, you know, about the value of the house and the, the equity in it. But uh, more importantly, I think the year on year portfolio uh, performance, which is net of my withdrawals, was about 12.6 percent up. So that felt great to me. How about you? <laughs> yeah. It, and especially since you were drawing a, a lot less than that, right? <laughs> Yeah, much less. <laughs> uh, yeah. My, yeah, I do liquid retirement assets only in my net worth roll up. Um, and it's something I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the real estate component. But my year on year portfolio gain um, loss net of contributions was 17.3%. Uh, nice. So that was a nice addition there. And of course, you know, I've been buying <laughs> the long, slow grind down for the past couple of years. And so you and I have different of course, it's going to look different, right? Yeah, um, of course. And we did we made a lot of contributions last year because we we were fortunate that we could. So the year on year portfolio gain was up close to forty percent, thirty nine point seven percent. So it was a big year for us, and um, I like having that as a tracked figure so I can look back on previous years. And it's just I just have a table um, that I used to track those year on year gains right. or losses as they were for the past couple of years. But it's nice to see it kind of turn around this year, man. Uh, let's touch on real estate just for a minute. I sure. don't look at real estate because I don't hold a mortgage and I know I need a place to live. So I'm not planning on liquidating that as an asset. I have heard people tracking this as purchase price only. Um, instead of including the appreciated value of the real estate. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing necessarily. Um, if you have plans to move in the next five years, you know, you may want to be looking at that as an asset that you could liquidate and then possibly turn into another piece of real estate or, uh, you know, get another mortgage or whatever. How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, to me, mathematically, I don't agree with the using the purchase price because real estate is, while it is not a fixed uh, sort of performance, there's enough data around you, uh, you know, in the real estate market to know the sort of present value of your house. And so I do base mine on present value minus some safety factor. So I think it's appropriately conservative. So in my area of the three major platforms for, you know, kind of looking at real estate, um, we use one and then th that's on the more conservative end and then go 10% below that. So in my area, Zillow is actually more conservative than the other two. Okay. So we go there and we do minus 10% and I call that like the, the amount I could definitely sell my house for today. And then I just look at that minus my current mortgage owed and then I just have the equity in the house. So pretty simple. It's just a tracking line item, just like our 529 fund. That's not part of our net worth, yeah. but I track it in the same place. Yeah. it's. And I, I didn't mention the 529s, but that is another thing we're looking at and, yeah. you know, keeping an eye on, obviously. And um, yeah, it's part of your net worth, ultimately, but it's probably not something you're going to redirect to right. funding your retirement, which is really exactly. why I discount real estate so heavily. I think the only reason we look at it quarterly or maybe the main reason we look at it quarterly is while we, our present plan of record is holding on to this house uh, and living in it at least part of the year, we're open to the idea that that might not be true. So it's not a bad idea for us to at least keep somewhat apprised of the value. But I think that's about the most useful part of it. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, the mistake could be made uh, to really include this and look at this as uh, a part of your net worth when you think that, when you understand that most Americans, you know, most of their net worth is tied up in their home, in That's their right. real estate. And um, it's, but the fact is, unless you're willing to sell it and uh, live off the proceeds, it's just, <laughs> it's not something I'm going to count toward my retirement. We agree. And, and I should say, you know, back to uh, your comment about your performance, you know, net of actual contributions. I think, you know, bravo. Uh, clearly, your savings rate was great this year. Um, I am not making new contributions right. per se. I'm really moving money around. So I do put money into my HSA every year. And that uh, allows me to kind of adjust my Magi down, which is helpful for ACA. And it also, you know, has that those tax advantages of the HSA that someday I will with, withdraw for those pricey medical expenses I had this year. Uh, and also we are still putting money into Roths at this point. Sure. So naturally, um, I'm tracking savings rate as part of this kind of roll up for 2023. Yeah. You're probably not tracking that so much. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> consumption rate. Consumption for sure. rate, right? <laughs> so my <clears throat> my savings rate post tax was about sixty four percent, sixty three, a little over sixty three percent. Well done. And we also saved college costs, so that's not in there as well. So um, you know, we we've talked about this before, but we basically do the kind of pay yourself first strategy. Exactly. We set savings goals. And once those savings goals are met, then we live off the kind of balance. Um, and I know not everyone is able to do that necessarily, but that's worked pretty well for us. And then I also do an expense look back. You mentioned that you do this. I just take my credit cards. Uh, I, I have a credit card that I use, two credit cards, one for travel, one for cash back, and um, just look at the expenses at a high level and just kind of say, um, you know, Laura and I were doing some projections recently um, looking at actually looking at the budget again yep. in a more granular way and saying, hey, is this gonna cover it based on our past couple of years of spend? Um, and I think we're in a good place. There's some, definitely some places we can trim and having that credit card statement in front of us allows us to make those decisions. I know you said that you've done this before, right? You look for categories that are a little bit off or high or whatever. And absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, for us, you know, housing costs are typically pretty high up there. Healthcare costs, those, those don't affect us really at this point because healthcare is covered through my wife's employer and, you know, our, our home is paid for. So really after savings, we're talking like, you know, food, shopping, travel, some home expenses. We did some renovation of our, our living room this year. Um, so those are kind of the, the higher ticket items. How about you? Did you have anything that jumped out other than the healthcare? Uh, no, actually, otherwise things were pretty much to plan. Healthcare spending was the one that went way up. Um, I would say I had better traceability on uh, travel uh, and other kind of, you know, optional expenses this year, just because of, you know, sort of the honestly building sinking funds that we talked about in an earlier episode. Um, I could always track it, but I think I, you know, now that I have really good clarity and Lori and I sat down and did the, you know, what do we really want to spend? And let's make sure we take it out of the portfolio and have it available to us. That really helped a lot. Uh, that was under control. Uh, the only thing that went out of control this year was healthcare. I mean, to the point where I'll be itemizing uh, deductions this year for sure due to due to healthcare expenses expenses being above the uh, the limit. Yep. Okay. So anything else for a look back on 2023? No. On net, I feel pretty good about it. I think it was pretty clear. Happy that the market was in our favor for all of us. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I want to move into the projections and goals. That's kind of phase two of uh, all right. this annual review process. So looking forward to 2024, I kind of break this down into financial category. So um, I think we talked about this before, but savings yep. goals, uh, my five number is insight. And um, so I see that it's now possible. And um, the savings goals that we're setting are pretty aggressive, but yep. I think they're totally achievable based on the past couple of years and what we've been able to accomplish. Sounds like uh, your savings goals may be more like paying off mortgage. Is that true? No, I'm not paying off the mortgage. <laughs> this was discussed on the Discord recently, and it's pretty fascinating to hear people's views on this, especially when they're in the fortunate position of holding a low interest rate, you know, 2.275 or something like that. Um, it's, you know, something we all think about, but nope, I'm not doing it. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> early in the year, tax, a lot of tax planning for me. I'm closing the books on 2023. Um, this past year, I pivoted to, um, in, instead of, investing early and then earning taxes with yep. my business lumpy income as soon as i earned 
I set away for taxes in my in a separate brokerage account, and I just yep. kept that in a money market fund, and that has been so life changing for me because awesome. this is the time that I would this is the time of the year that I would get to the end of twenty twenty <laughs> yeah, end of the year I do the taxes for the business and I'd be like oh man You're right I have to come up with this you know bolus of cash and I'd always be behind um, I would always be playing catch up so having made that change is great and it's really just fits with that sort of pay myself first kind of right. mentality and I don't know why I didn't do it sooner but that's been a real positive change um, well that's great let me ask you where did yeah. the idea come from. Was it part of your last year's review? You're like, this stresses me out so much, I'm gonna do it different? Like, what, what changed? It, it, exactly that. Because I said to Laura, I said, I never wanna be in this position again because I felt like, okay, now I gotta earn the tax payment. And I, I don't wanna be behind in that respect. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's, res being, it's part of being a responsible business owner to really have that all in order. It wasn't like I was gonna skip taxes or anything, but right, it, no, it's just definitely a stress trying to come up with that payment. Um, and especially if you have a good fourth quarter, like, you know, well, typically a lot of businesses do and, and my business is no different. And um, right. so it was nice having that um, in the bank. And, and in part, I owe that to uh, working with this other agency who's really helped me sort of look forward many more months in the future than I had in the past. Uh, business operator, the solo operator, I'm operating month to month. That's how I'm used sure. to operating. And now we've got a long term roadmap and a plan. And this just naturally fits into that. So that felt really good. Um, spending reductions for this year. I'm looking at some austerity measures because oh, really? our, our spending got a little out of control in the fourth quarter. Um, that was correlated with, you know, a good quarter for the business and a yeah, little, little bit bet. of celebrating and, you know, hey, blowing it out, taking, we took an end of the year New Year's trip and kind of blew it out a little bit, which is great. Like I wouldn't trade those memories for anything, but exactly. also I think we can get like 90% of the benefit for half the cost <laughs> is my feeling. Um, and I, you know, Laura and I kind of had a chat about that a little bit. Um, other things that we're thinking about college expenses. So we have our youngest is getting ready to go off to school. So he's been accepted yeah. to a few places and nice. we're now starting to look at some of the financial aid package numbers that are coming in. And that's a whole financial planning exercise. Uh, presently, we are still just paying um, semester to semester. We're not using the 529s, we've kind of left those sequestered for now. Okay. Um, but we'll see in the fall, I plan to change that. I think we're gonna start catching in the 529s just because I don't know about you but the investment options there not the best they're uh, you know I'd rather be no well, I'd rather make some pivots that I can't make in the, in those accounts what, what how are you handling that so it's, it's interesting that this is coming up because I've just gone through and made what I think is going to be the last adjustment um, for probably a year where I just kind of I started to partition the um, the asset allocation in the 529 I sequestered you know the freshman year funds. And then the the second and third year are a little more moderate. And I left the fourth year funds, you know, you know, basically all stock. Um, and so Lori and I talked about that, um, you know, and we are planning on using the 529. We have ours now positioned where barring tragedy or serious errors on my part of allocating those assets, we should be okay. Or I, I figure worst case it'll cover you know, 85 to 90% of expenses. So um, I'm feeling pretty good about it, but we are intending to to use the 529 funds for year one. Yeah, cool. And do you have you looked in, into liquidating those at all, what the process is? Oh, yes, I have. Uh, yeah. Actually, it's coincidental that uh, the provider, it's probably not coincidental, they know exactly how old the beneficiary is. <laughs> yeah. They sent us a little like, make sure you know how to do this yeah. uh, thing. And it was actually pretty clear and they did a good job um, and so, uh, go college savings, Iowa, uh, it was nice and clear. <laughs> I'm in Nevada's plan. So nice. There you go. Yeah, they, they don't talk to me at all, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, the right. last thing in terms of my overview and summary for projections and goals in the year, I'm doing kind of an insurance review, but I, that's just cause I do it for the business and I look at all the vehicles and it's, you know, we're doing as good as we can, but it's not great. <laughs> But, you know, in terms of just looking at our coverage is correct, you know, is everything in place from a professional liability standpoint and errors and omissions and umbrella, the whole thing. Yep, uh, do exactly. you do that as well? I do. I consider it before every uh, period. So we're on a May and November twice a year. And so May is the period in which the policies renew. So then I go through and do that and often we'll reshop the homeowners, which in California, is becoming potentially a disaster. So we'll just leave it where it is for now. Uh -huh. But 
uh, yeah, a lot of providers have pulled out of California and everyone sort of had across the board 20, 25% increases last year. So besides that, <laughs> um, the insurance is, is in okay order at this point. Okay, got it. So in, in, I kind of have this um, order of operations that I just keep um, as a reminder in my notion um, to talk about, okay, like first dollars go here, second dollars go here. Do you have something like that? Um, so I did when I was still investing, yeah. but now it's pretty straightforward. I mean, yes, the, I have a, like the tiniest version of that in that I always want to fund the HSA. Yep. And then at the end of the year, I want to make sure I've been, you know, look at my income statements and decide what we're doing for Roth or other funding and then Roth conversions if we were doing them. Okay. Yeah. So our first step in the year is like, we're going to fund our Roths and we have to do that through the back door. Um, we just do that early in January. So given that we're over 50, we, we put $8,000 each in there for my wife and for myself. Um, and we're basically sending post-tax dollars here, um, the way it works out in our situation. So, you know, we make too much to contribute directly and, you know, we're being taxed on that income either way. So it just makes sense to, you know, contribute to the Roth through mm -hmm. the back door. So I think a lot of people um, who are in the FI movement looking to early That's retire, right. they end up in that situation. And it's not something I had been doing for a very long time. And, you know, we did a financial advisor meeting and he's like, hey, why aren't you doing the back door? I'm like, oh, yeah, why am I not doing that? So anyway, um, I've seen this discussed in some of the fire channels on Reddit recently, just people kind of opening their eyes to this. So yeah, that's step one. Step two, um, for me, since we still have income coming in, um, we're going to fund our pre-tax accounts. And so I just lay this all out on my dashboard so I can see, okay, so this year, my solo 401k, I can do 30500 as an employee, and then I can do 46000 as an employer. So I can do both sides of that contribution because I'm right. a sole operator here. Um, and so that's 76,500. I know there are other plans that you can structure, um, you know, it's cash balance plans. There's different things that you can structure. I have not looked into that because my income has been so lumpy. I'm kind of afraid right. to commit to something that's like a long-term commitment. Um, for a pretty high dollar figure, but there are other options if you are if your business is earning seven figures, you probably want to look into those. Um, my wife then funds her four hundred three b. We look at what that projection is over the year. Um, we she also has access to a four fifty seven b, which is basically deferred compensation. Right. Um, but we've decided to not contribute to that anymore. Um, so investment options are one, and then we looked at some of the liquidation options if in the next you know, year or so she decides she wants to step away from that position. Um, it's, we've made some, some plans with respect to that. So we can talk about that in a future episode, but uh, I like to have all that pre-tax information right there up front. So we know, okay, after the Ross, we're doing this. So we'll work on that. And then, um, we don't have access to an HSA. Um, but this year looking forward, projecting forward, I'm looking at health, um, insurance options. And for the business, I'm looking at if Laura comes to work as an employee of the business, I can essentially pay her in uh, benefits, health benefits. Mm -hmm. So I can structure an HRA, um, a health retirement arrangement, I believe it is. It's oh, like yeah. Section 105 of the tax code. And I can pay her in benefits and just moves money off the balance sheet and around on the balance sheet, turns that into an expense. And then she'll onboard the family onto the health plan. So that's a way of, if you're a small business owner of kind of you know, getting healthcare as to be covered a covered expense. Um, you become a bit of an expert in that area. I bet I, I would imagine at this point, I will, if I ever get motivated enough to do something as a business, I will absolutely, uh, uh, take you on as a consultant. Yeah. And I'm, I'm working with a broker. So, you know, you are, yeah, because cool. it's complicated as you know, uh, that's yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I've just like scratched the surface of some of that stuff and I'm like, Oh boy. Right. <laughs> um, let's see, we have college savings. So I have a college savings target that we're working on every, every two weeks we're contributing to. And then, um, once all of those kind of steps are walked through, then we hit the taxable brokerage. So we're just going to dollar cost average into that. Um, whenever we get to that point in the year, that's what we'll do. And that's kind of our secret weapon when it comes to early retirement, because, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of basis in there that we can pull. Yes. And in some future point, we won't have to uh, worry as much about how the income hits our magi uh, when we're trying to qualify for ACA subsidies and things like that. 
That's right. And and at this point, you know, I'm just kind of thinking of the intersection of two ideas here, you know, kind of really establishing your phi date or solidifying it, taking off that question mark, which to me means you stopped moving the goalposts, by the way. So that that's also good, even though you didn't put it in those words. I'm going to I'm going to assume you did. But also <laughs> talking about the brokerage account means that you've now, you know, got a clarity on what the time span looks like. Well, some clarity, because you still don't exactly know what continued business income is going to look like. Right. But you have a little more information about that delta between when you stop working in earnest and when you're eligible to withdraw from retirement assets without jumping through hoops. So does that mean it's become an easier task for you to figure out how to you know, make sure the brokerage is where it needs to be? Or, uh, or is that something you're still working through? No, it's easier for sure. And we've basically we're using the safe withdrawal rate toolbox to model out some pretty conservative scenarios. Got it. Um, like very conservative scenarios. So um, yes, cool. I set the number. I'm not moving the goalposts until maybe later this year. And then <laughs> <laughs> there we have it. I don't know, dude. <laughs> I, I, mean, I can already see that episode title. We move the goalposts again. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter if the phi number moves. It's just the um, RE number that everyone's so bugged out, bugged about, or the yeah. RE date, right? So he's never, never going to retire. He's never going to retire. All right, so that's enough of the financial stuff, man. Uh, how about personal goals? Do you set any personal goals? I'm really curious about this for you. I do, um, okay. and I have financial goals too. But um, on the personal side, my goals are, you know, first and foremost, enjoy the time my family has this year in the final year of school. I'm sure exactly the same for you, right? Uh, we're, we're just working on some trips. We're probably gonna go uh, see what to one of the total eclipse locations, uh, the solar eclipse that's gonna happen in April, nice. which is nicely timed around spring break. Um, uh, another exciting goal, uh, personal goal for the year is to really plan what that, in earnest, what that this next phase of retirement's gonna look like, right? Our, son is going to be in school. We are going to be empty nesters. What does that actually look like? Um, you know, travel, et cetera. You know, we have some periods of time we've been talking about when we think we'd like to do stuff in the fall and in the spring. But as we, Lori and I were talking about just taking a walk yesterday, like let's really start to nail down. What do we think that first one looks like yeah. after, you know, we're, he's comfortably in school and settled, right? What do we do? Um, easier personal tasks is kind of, you know, is there a next learning opportunity, next educational interest, because I'm in Spanish two now, I'm planning on ceasing after that. I, I don't think I want to take Spanish three. Uh -huh. um, we'll see, maybe I'll even withdraw for Spanish two if I'm like, well, this is too much work. Uh, but I enjoyed the first uh, the first semester, so I'm gonna take another. But uh, I suspect- I love the idea of learning a language. I hate the actual execution of it. <laughs> I just, yeah. I'm so terrible at it. Uh, I mean, it's been a while since you tried. You might find, you know, it's like I tell, uh, I was telling, uh, bunch of bunch of teens were over our house my there was a uh some kind of gathering here and we were talking about grades and i mentioned something about uh you know i, I got an a in in spanish i said but it's it's pretty easy to do well when you're taking one class and not taking six and you have ample time you know you're not trying to do your homework around jobs <laughs> and you know other school work etc so you, you really you shouldn't take any pride in getting an a in one class that you're taking then um well, but you're just uh, setting me up for failure man because you no, don't know how no, i learn no. languages I mean, or don't <laughs> i mean Lori only put in half effort i think she would say and i'm pretty sure she got an a as well so we went to quebec city not oh, for the new year's and um it's french speaking there Pri primarily french speaking and uh well, I dusted off my French and it was pretty, pretty poor. <laughs> the most humbling thing about being anywhere in, in the province of Quebec is that they immediately switch to English if your <laughs> French is anything other than strong. And I'm like, dude, I took three years of French and you're still switching to English. Like, come on, man, I can do this. Let me do it. <laughs> and their English is great. <laughs> of course it is. Oh, <laughs> completely <so> bilingual. <laughs> yes, it's embarrassing. I just have to say. But I, I mean, good, good on you for, for doing that. And, you know, Spain, pretty amazing place to fire, I would say. Yeah, and a lot of fascinating countries, only a few of which I've been to so far, um, out of the many where Spanish is language number one. So exactly. I feel like yeah. it's only gonna help. Doesn't doesn't help you in Portugal though, sorry. It doesn't, I know about four words of Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I have to work on that. <laughs> there's a lot of zhuzh. Yes, there's a lot of sounds that I don't know how to make. To just to add to the list of sounds I can't make, like I can't roll my R's either, which is very important in Spanish. I was gonna say that's languages. Rough. Yeah. 
I'm okay. working. <laughs> Watch some YouTube tutorials. They haven't helped yet. Yeah, it's funny. Our personal goals, you know, are overlapping. We're at a very similar time in our life, right? You know, we're just becoming empty nesters. So, I uh, one of the things I had was do more with the time that you have. Um, Ooh, I like time, that. Time is short. I did have travel and adventure category. I have a, a list. We're trying to do, still trying to do one trip a quarter. But last year it felt like a little, a little shallow. The 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 travel felt like I, I wanted to do more, and it was one of the yeah. things when Laura and I were looking at the the year. Um, in review and, and we're looking at our budget and we're like geez I mean they were spending some spendy trips but it feels like we want to do more yeah when we reach retirement so it's something we're working on I had hobbies on here just because I've been really bad at hobbies lately man I, I've been um, neglecting things that interest me outside of work I've just been you, you know investing every spare moment in work and um, that may just be a function of get, trying to get to the finish line um, but it's something that I, I feel like is missing in my life yeah. a little bit yeah. You got to pick up that guitar more. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I definitely you got a family will. full of rockers and Oh my god. You, you know, know, you had a little house band built in there. You didn't <laughs> take enough advantage of it. I feel that. <laughs> oh man. Um I and I also have uh professional objectives and then that's okay. a separate discussion that you know, high level I'm trying to transition out of day-to-day -day operational involvement. So there is a, a nice. concerted effort to to do that. Um I'm implementing some scalable systems and processes, which I hadn't had in place in the past, and creating more assets. And there's, there's, I, I kind of try and create a, two or three sentences of goals for the business, like high level goals, um, and then I really fill it in by quarter, and I map out like content and what I'm making and what I'm going to be promoting and things like that. So it's, it's more planned than it's ever been. Um, really, but I, I wanted to kind of understand from you. Um, like, how do you look at like long-term goal setting? Cause I'm someone who's really personally motivated by having goals in the beginning of the year and, and you know, it sets the direction, but I don't get the sense that you're doing the, doing those in the same way. No, it's true. And it's something that was such a big part of my work life, like yeah. five year planning versus <laughs> one year planning. And you know, it's something I got into and the long-term planning is really hard, but it is pretty fascinating work if you do it well. But personally, I don't. I think okay. maybe part of that is just we've we've found it so common that we surprise ourselves five years later as to what we found ourselves in. But I think, you know, the type of planning we do do is, is more directional. Like yeah. we want to do more of these kinds of trips. And so, yeah. OK, we'll start doing that and try that and see if that is actually what we think we want to do. And then maybe we'll kind of alter that goal. That's kind of how I see it going. But we definitely don't presently at least have this idea that well in in five years we want to do these things in this way and in 10 years we see ourselves here yeah. how do you think about it do you well do you was, do things like that i mean i was asking laura because i'm such a planner and especially at the beginning of the year i, I kind of take that dead week between christmas and new year's and really like i, I love that space where nobody's really doing anything and right. i can kind of stretch time a little bit and say here's where i want to be and I, I love that kind of projecting forward um but I'd, I haven't done it for my personal life, really. But as I could see the value of it in terms of in, in retirement, if I'm planning big trips that have a bigger spend or yeah. there's something that I'm physically not going to be able to do later in life. You know, we've talked about the dive of zero concept of, you know, spending life years in the decades when, where they make the most sense. Um, but Laura was pushing back and saying, you know, I, she doesn't really do that from a personal standpoint. And she's like, I'm forced to do it in the office. And I right. feel like I am ready to leave that behind. <laughs> I don't want, yeah. I want to be spontaneous. I want to, you know, do things as I, you know, feel motivated to do them. And I, I guess my personal worry with that is when I've done that in the past, um, I get to the end of the year and I go, Oh, well, I wish I had done more weekend trips, right. you know? And so it's the one area that I think we're both aligned on Laura and I is the planning trips. So yeah, we've kind of rallied around that as an initial kind of goal setting and planning point. Um, to maybe make this off ramp into retirement whenever that comes in the next year or two, whatever. Well, and I like that idea and I think it's a good one. I think, you know, something that, that I'm sitting here thinking about and maybe it's just I'm marrying the die with zero idea with what you just said. And then I'm thinking of the, I think you actually mentioned this again on 30 by 40 recently that that blog post, um, the wait, but why one with the little boxes showing how many, how many yeah. occurrences you have left of something. Yeah. And so, 
I'm having this idea that Lori and I should really put our heads together and like, what are the trips that like right now we would say, we really want to do these things at some point, you know, be, let's, let's call it before we die, even though we know when we're of a certain age, we can't do those things. But like, while we're able, what are those things we want to do? And let's make sure we do those or at least evaluate those every year and say, nope, it's not important right now. I'm going to keep it on the list. But, you know, I, I think That's we good. don't have a document like that. Like, you know, our possible futures list is not as fully developed as yours and something that more comes up verbally and we haven't really documented. But we haven't sat down and said, like, you know what, here are 10 things that we both agree. These are pretty important, at least as we see them today at, at 50 and 48. Yeah. Let's make sure we do them. I, I think we should probably do that. Yeah, I'm going to do that, too. All right. I like it. I mean, the last thing I committed to doing on the show, I you didn't, didn't do. do it. I can tell. No, I, was I didn't ask I start, you about that. I started focusing on myself instead of on writing. And wow, so I, I feel like I, I just pushed it aside for a more important goal. But writing is still on that list. I promise you. I think about it all the time. Is it? All right. Uh, well, yes. All the time. When yep. it becomes important enough, you'll do it. And that, that's... Absolutely. And I, I think I've just put the right thing at the forefront. Yeah. But this, uh, this idea, this is not hard, but it's important. So I think we should go off just like we did when we think we're thinking about like where to live. Yeah. Just go off independently okay. and document our list and then sit down and see how much or how little overlap there yeah. is and then just figure it out. Yeah, like like it, it. That, that's like it's, that's a fun problem to have. Totally. Like oh, these are all amazing trips. How will we decide? Like I mean that's a very fortunate position, right? So that, that should be fun. Yeah, and I I mean honestly I was going to say we don't have a trip with you guys planned yet this year that I would like to get on the books and you know absolutely figure out what that looks like we've talked about doing the canyon maybe i don't know if yes. that's still of interest um but that would that's still cool to me i i have a fishing trip in mind but um <laughs> i like i always I like a fishing trip i know Lori's probably not going to be so into that but um anyway we should talk about what that looks like because i don't want to let the year go by without doing something fun again I agree. Let's right, do it. Cool. I'm just going to show up at your house at some point and you're going to be like, oh, that's handy. <laughs> you're welcome anytime, man. I wouldn't recommend uh, this time of year, though. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get it. <laughs> it's. <laughs> Were you thinking of showing up like next week? <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll see. I'll figure something out. <laughs> All right. My mother-in-law is going to be here, so you're going to have to share a bed with her. <laughs> uh, I mean, that that would be awkward. I'll just sleep in the, the unheated loft of the uh It's a bunk bed. It's a bunk bed. It's a little. That's no, all right. It's heated in here, man. What are you kidding me? You don't heat heat it at night. Yeah, heck yeah. Oh, okay. I'll stay in there. <laughs> it's still I like where I tell you to stay. It strikes me we didn't talk about your financial uh, review we did. process, but um, can you hit hit on that in a, at a high level? Eh, it's not that interesting. Okay. <laughs> I do have financial goals, but they're really boring. the The top level one is you know repeat on budget performance, hopefully even better. Um, I would love not to have excessive medical expenses. Uh, <laughs> one very practical thing yep. that would be good for me and I really aim to do this year is move some tracking that is monthly to quarterly and even simplify further my financial tracking, my expense tracking. I did that this year. I took things uh, to uh, a less granular level. I think that was a good thing. I think I can do even more. And I'd also like to do a little more tax planning. Um, I've done some myself. I've engaged my previous CPA in some in the past. Um, probably not as much as I wanted to do, but those hourly rates really tick up pretty quickly. Um, I've switched to a new CPA this year for my tax preparation. And he's also got some blanket tax planning as part of that. So I'm interested to see what that looks like because that's fixed fee. So uh, I'm curious because I, you know, the Roth conversion question, which is a whole episode unto itself, yeah. isn't a slam dunk for me based on my particulars, but I really want to make sure I exhaust that question. Uh, and the answer to it can change over time. So I'm looking forward to having a, a, a good conversation about that this year. And the last thing is I think that the fourth quarter of 2024 is going to be the first chance to really see what balancing kind of travel versus normal spending is going to be like right um so it's only going to be uh, an initial kind of sense of it you know 2025 i guess will be a truer test um so i'm interested in seeing what that transition looks like as empty nesters but uh my only goal is to just be attentive to it and see what i can learn and plan for 2025 as a result nice cool yeah that sounds That's good fun. yeah I, I wonder um 
if there are other tools instead of a CPA that can you use like new retirement or anything yeah. like that or new, new retirement has the new retirement.com has the best um, Roth conversion uh, planning tool that yeah. I've seen so far. And yeah. I used the previous version of it, um, but they've updated it over the last year and it's pretty impressive now. And so I actually owe it to myself to do a better job of that. And we do have a link to new retirement in the, uh, in the resources section on two sides of fi.com. It's a free trial. Um, you know, you help out the show a little by doing the free trial, but it's something that I see how far they've come with the Roth planning capabilities now, uh, the Roth conversion planning opportunity. So uh, I'm definitely going to check that out too. Okay, cool. Yeah, make a video. Thanks. <laughs> Put that on your to-do list, pal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so good at the to do to do list at present. I know you're not. God, what's I'm up with awful that? Awful at it, man. I really am. All right. Well, I feel good about last year, man. I see all the posts on Reddit. Everyone's like, "Hey, I just crossed X. I just crossed yep. Y." So let's keep this momentum going, man. Otherwise, I'm gonna slide back into a, the depression I was in in 2022, and it's not gonna be pretty. No way, man. You've done so many great things for the business. It's going to keep you super motivated and we're going to have a great 2024. Cheers, man. All right. Good chatting. All right. Peace out. All right. Bye.